so today I'll be talking about MicroPython on an ESP8266. So just out of curiosity, uh, a show of hands, do have any of you heard of MicroPython before I know what it is? Well, well pretty, quite a few. And how about the ESP8266? Does anybody have any idea what that is? A few people. All right. Well, hopefully by the end, uh, you will know what both of those items are, and maybe I'll have inspired you to, uh, to uh, investigate and do some sort of creative project on your own with them. Uh, if you would like to get the slides, this link will be at the end uh, later, but I posted the slides at speakerduck.com, and so you're welcome to take a look and follow along or uh, look later. Let's see. All right. Uh, so just a little tiny bit about me. So I've spent about 20 years working on enterprise software projects. That's my um, professional thing that I do. Uh, during that time, I've worked in all sorts of roles from being a developer to being a program manager to being a solution architect. Uh, so that's kind of my day job. Uh, one project I like to mention, it's been a couple of years now, but it's an interesting project and it's uh, relevant for Python, I'll explain that, is uh, I worked on the Ford Dealer Connection project. So Dealer Connection is a platform that Ford uses to provide websites for all of their dealers in the United States and Canada. And so dealers can customize their websites, but there's also parts of the website that Ford locks down uh, for legal reasons and so forth where the dealers have to display the information according to Ford's rules, as well as Ford needs to be able to update and publish content to the dealer's websites. Uh, so a few years ago, I was involved with a project to rebuild that from the ground up, and we built it in uh, Python and MongoDB. So if that's of interest to you, I'd love to talk about that story. If you're maybe working on something similar, I'd be interested to find out what you're doing as well. And then lastly, uh, just, I like to work with microcontrollers and, and MicroPython, and I think the origin of that is, is uh, I learned to program when I was pretty young, and probably the first language I learned after BASIC was x86 assembler language. I don't really know why, but I've always uh, since then enjoyed um, working with low-level details of systems and, and so forth. But what you'll find out in a few minutes is uh, the things you can do now are so much more accessible than they used to be uh, you know, 20 years ago. So. So that's a big deal. So for this, I'm gonna start out with a demo. I don't have a great picture, but I actually have the physical demo to show you. So to tell you, to tell you what this is. Uh, so for, I saw this on the internet. Somebody uh, had built a stick figure costume for their child. So I did this for my son for Halloween, my two-year-old. And the thing that I think is better about mine is the one I saw was a single color uh, outfit, so you can see, I'll, I'll plug it in in a moment. Uh, and it can work with the battery pack, but I'm gonna actually just plug it into a USB charger here because that's how it's powered. Um, anyways, uh, this can change colors, so it's multi-colors, like 24-bit color, basically. And it's using a microcontroller, the ESP8266, and so it's actually running MicroPython code and can run, hence, different, all sorts of different applications that would, you know, change the light color based on uh, whatever I wanted to do. So let me show that to you. Uh, it takes like 10 seconds to start. I have a delay so that I have some, some more demos I'll be showing you, which I want to be able to break in, so I intentionally made a delay, but you'll see in a moment. Was your son think pretty awesome? Uh, well, he's two, and uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> like just two, so he, yeah, I thought it was cool, but I didn't get too many, too many words out of it, so. <laughs> so I've set this to change colors every three seconds right now, but again, it's all done in Python, so it is configurable. All right. We'll be doing some more demos with that, and we'll come back around and look at the code that actually makes this work. But for now, I will disconnect. Let's see. Uh, so this is a picture of an ESP8266 developer board. Uh, this is actually the board that's in that costume. And so you can see some wires coming in at the bottom. Uh, the light strips that are in the costume, uh, they use lights that are generally referred to as NeoPixels, so they're multicolor RGB LEDs. And uh, the, just the layout of the costume, there's actually six separate strips. So the green wires are six green wires at the bottom, and then this is powered. But this is the device that's uh, inside here that's running MicroPython. And we'll see, a, we'll see a picture in a minute of a device that actually, there's this metal shield over the, over the chips, but I have a picture of one that doesn't have that, and we'll see the actual chip that's in here. I'll explain all about this. So the background on uh, MicroPython is that there was, let's make sure I go to my notes. 
So uh, Damien George, back in 2013, he's a theoretical physicist that uh, was living in Australia, studying in Australia at the time. And he had a question that he wanted to answer, which is he was curious if it would be possible to program microcontrollers using some sort of high-level language. And maybe the first thing before even uh, answering the question is like, why does that matter? Well, it's, traditionally microcontrollers are programmed with C or C++, assembly language, something like that. Uh, but that has all the challenges. I mean, basically we lose all the benefits that we all love being here at the Python conference about Python, right? Is we have to deal with our own memory management. There's lots of things that can go wrong. It's hard to, to debug. Just the cycle time of making changes is much longer. And so Damien was wondering, hey, can we, could we actually start programming microcontrollers in, in Python? Because he had worked with that in the past. And so Damien started a Kickstarter project, uh, which had two pieces. One was to build this device that's pictured over here. This is called a Pi board. And so it's just the device that he built to run MicroPython. And, um, and that device is actually running an ARM, you can kind of see it, but an ARM processor, and you may have heard of ARM, ARM processors before. Um, right, so, uh, so anyways, he built this board, and then he started this Kickstarter project to do the board and then do MicroPython. And after about a year and a half, in April, April 2015, he finished that project and he was successful in, in meeting the Kickstarter goals, which was to build MicroPython and deploy that to, to real people, ship out, ship, shipping out these boards so people could get started. Um, and this is the current MicroPython logo up here. So, So a question to answer is I've mentioned the word microcontroller a couple times. Uh, a common term for that is an MCU, a microcontroller unit. So let me just explain briefly what, what that means. Uh, there's no hard and fast definition, but this is, gives you a pretty good idea and gives you an idea of how this is different than maybe a traditional computer. So the MCU includes a system on a chip, which means like, so this is a single chip that's basically an entire computational unit, right? So it has some sort of core in it that it can actually do computation, run code, as well as it has RAM to actually store execute the program, as well as it typically has some sort of ROM built in to store the code, and then some sort of like oscillator that actually controls the frequency of how quickly the, the device runs, which is uh, maybe configurable. So we have the self-contained unit that we can build circuits and systems from. And then typically these devices have some sort of programmable I.O., which means that there's these extra pins, like so there's some that take power, but the others can be hooked up and configured as either inputs or outputs. So we can hook up lights, or we could hook up motors, or we could hook up any sort of sensor. Um, this particular device doesn't have very many inputs or outputs because it only has eight pins altogether. But on a device with more, there's also support for different kinds of uh, like I.O. buses and more specialized protocols. Two common ones that are used for these kind of devices is something called I squared C or, or SPI, which is a serial profile interface. But probably the most important thing about these microcontrollers is that they're really power efficient, right? I can potentially build some sort of circuit, maybe have this go to sleep and uh, wake up every so often and do something. And people build systems where these microcontrollers literally last for uh, months or years on a set of batteries, right? We don't have to change them. And so we certainly can't do that with a traditional computer. And then lastly, just that there's a, well, almost lastly, there's a, these are very inexpensive. So this particular device you can probably buy in a quantity of one for like a dollar. And if you buy them, you know, if you're buying 10,000 or something, they're gonna be half that or even less than that. Uh, and the last thing just to understand is because this is a pretty limited device, despite it has all these cool things that it does, the RAM, the processing, it doesn't have that much uh, capability. So there's generally no operating system that's running. It's not like this is running Linux or some uh, version of Windows or something like that. It's just a bare processor. You put your code in it and it just executes the instructions as you've sent it to them, sent it to the device. So, um, question, where are the microcontrollers actually used? And they're used literally everywhere, right? I mean, you probably have hundreds of them in your house, right? Certainly devices that you interact with all the time. You know, your appliances have microcontrollers that control the different uh, operations that it does, tech checking for faults, controlling the timing like a washing machine. Think about your remote control. I mean, that's something that it only wakes up when you actually push buttons to send uh, signals to your TV or stereo, whatever the case may be. And think about how often you change batteries in the, a, a remote control, right? Not very often, maybe once a year, maybe much less than that. So uh, that's an example. So key fobs, toys, uh, sprinkler control system. If you haven't seen this, this is a, 
uh, Amazon Dash button. So Amazon will sell this to you for $5. And then when anytime you push that button, it'll actually place an order over Wi-Fi to Amazon. And in this case, it'll send you some Mountain Dew. And, and if you buy one of these for $5, I think they'll actually give you a $5 credit back on your first order. But uh, a device like this has a, you know, some battery and a microcontroller in it, and it's good for a few hundred pushes, and it's interacting with Wi-Fi, so that's pretty, pretty amazing. And of course, cars have many, many microcontrollers that all work together. So let's talk about what an ESP8266 is, since that's the title of the presentation, part of the title. Um, so this is a, mi a microcontroller that's built by a company named Espressif uh, out of China. And uh, basically the microcontroller is this chip here. And this particular microcontroller does not have built-in uh, ROM, doesn't have a place to store your code when it's powered off. So there's a separate flash memory chip, like a, you know, it would, similar to what would be like in a USB uh, flash drive that you might use. So there's a chip here. And then this overall board uh, hosts these things and also has a Wi-Fi antenna. So this particular device can run at 160 megahertz, has 160K of RAM, uh, that extra chip, the flash chip is like four megabytes, has built-in Wi-Fi. And you could buy one of these boards, actually the one that I used in the costume, which we uh, saw a picture of a few moments ago, those, uh, you can get them from China for about $4.50, and that includes shipping, so that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so that, I mean, that's the thing, of, like, to me, why this is super interesting is that it's just insane how cheap these are. I don't really know how companies can make any money if you just think about how they get, you have to manufacture it with all these parts and bring them together and then uh, get it to you, so. Uh, one more thing just to mention is, so it's really interesting, um, that these, tool, that these devices and then the corresponding tools are available now. So I mentioned learning to do some low-level programming a long time ago. And I was interested in reading some embedded systems magazines and that sort of thing. But the idea of getting involved with this when I was younger wasn't really feasible. I'm not an electrical engineer. So there was, you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to do this, you'd have to like buy an integrated circuit. You'd have to know how to do all the electronics to actually figure out how to wire it up, how to attach it to your computer. And if you could even figure that all out, many times you'd have to go out and buy some sort of expensive software from the manufacturer to be able to program it, right? And, and when I mean expensive, I mean, as I understand, like tens of thousands of dollars potentially. And so it's amazing is with devices like this now, uh, you know, I can buy a ready-made board that's very easy to use. I don't need to, I know, need to know much less. And then secondly, all these devices have like open source GCC tool chain. So tool chain is just the term describing the compiler and the, all the bits and pieces you need to build the code to, or to take the code you have and turn it into something that can be loaded on the device. But it's based on the, the GNU C compiler, so, uh, and it's open source, so you can download all the tools for free and get started. Okay. So a question that always comes up is people have heard of the Arduino, which is another device that's popular with makers. Um, this is a picture of an Arduino board. It has I.O. pins. It's similar to the 8266 in many ways. It has a standalone chip, which is actually the microcontroller. It's an Atmel at Mega chip. And the answer to this is that, I mean, in terms of MicroPython, is a the Arduino is great. There's a bunch of applications where it's really interesting. It's fun to play with as a, for maker purposes. But it has much less RAM than the 8266, has less ROM, it's slower, doesn't have Wi-Fi, so ultimately you can't run MicroPython on it. But you know, you could program it with C. But actually this board will cost you more than it would to order an 8266. The other sort of interesting anecdote is, uh, I don't know if this is entirely true, but when the 8266 came out, the, the, my understanding is the intent of the manufacturer was that you would buy an 8266 and wire it up to your Arduino to add Wi-Fi capability. So people did that, but then they started digging in and looking at the device, like what is this device and how does it actually work? And what people found out was that it was actually more powerful and much more capable than the Arduino. So basically people stopped using the Arduinos to just use 8266s instead, right? So. So kind of on the other end, a question is, what about the Raspberry Pi? Many people have heard of that. We saw one given away as a gift uh, yesterday. And so Raspberry Pi is a really cool device, but it's basically a miniaturized computer. So as a result of that, it's not really that power efficient. It's like your laptop. You could hook it up to batteries, but your laptop lasts for a few hours and then it's done. And so the same thing, if you had a Raspberry Pi and hooked it up to batteries, it'll last for a few hours, not months or years. And relative to the 8266, it's quite a bit more expensive. And the last thing is, um, 
a, a Raspberry Pi actually runs Linux, which, you know, Linux is great. But for certain kinds of applications, if you're trying to control devices where you need very specific timing requirements for whatever reason, it's very hard to guarantee that when you have a full-fledged operating system with lots of sort of unexpected tasks that can, can fire up and start happening. So just an example I thought of, of to sort of solidify that is I read an article recently where um, somebody had invented a way to protect against accidents where people are using like table saws and would get cut. And somehow they could actually detect like if a blade became into contact with, with a human, that it would somehow, I don't know exactly how, but it would be able to detect the characteristics of how it affected the motor moving and they could like instantaneously stop the device. So you might imagine like, hey, we could build that with a Raspberry Pi, but if it's unpredictable, then it may not work the way that it should. So there's certain kinds of problems where you need a device where you have complete control over the code that's actually executing. Okay, so uh, one thing I like to think about is uh, just I'm curious, like how, how fast are these things we're talking about? And so I did a little comparison of a few different things I've just talked about and one additional one. So this is, uh, and I should just say, when we think about computing devices, it's hard to define a single metric that covers, that boils the performance down to one, to one thing. It's just hard to do. But a way that people have thought about performance for a long time is something called dry stone MIPS. It's uh, something that was, I think, invented in the late 70s or 80s. And it's basically just comparing the amount of computation that happens in unit time relative to machines that were available then. So 1.0 is like a VAX machine from the late 70s. And so we can see the Arduino Uno is pretty slow. You know, the 80, 8266 is about uh, 10 times faster. The Pi board, which uses an ARM chip, is about twice as fast, despite the speed is uh, more or less the same. And of interest is, there's this new device that Espresso makes, which is called an ESP32. So it's not necessarily the replacement for the 8266, but it's much more powerful. It's about, unfortunately right now, it's about twice as expensive, but it's, I mean, which is still a small number, but just the same. And this, this device actually has two cores in it, running at 240 megahertz, and you can see it goes all the way up to 600. So this gives us an idea of the relative performance, but I mean, this is sort of out of context, right? So I wanted to add a little bit more context, and I'll show you that. So these are the same bars, just on a different scale, the yellow bars. And so two things I compared it to. So one is, uh, I mean, for me, something I'm familiar with is the Intel Pentium. When that came out, 100 megahertz Pentium back in 1994. I mean, I was curious, how does that compare to these devices that we have now to a computer from, from then? And you can see the performance, like where the Pi board's actually faster, at least using this metric. And on one hand, you could say, well, in 20 years, things haven't gotten that much faster. The performance is the same. That's kind of disappointing. I mean, that's an argument, but I would make the counter argument that there's two things to consider. So one is, I mean, we're talking about devices that cost $10, and when a Pentium came out, I, don't, I couldn't find the specific launch price, but they were in probably hundreds to thousands of dollars. I think a complete system was you know, like five or $6,000. So you can imagine the processor represented a good chunk of that price. Um, you know, so two orders of magnitude better in cost, at least. And then also, we think about power utilization. So a Pentium, much, much smaller than processors of today, but would run at about 10 watts of power, as opposed to an 8266, which it runs at about a tenth of a watt of power. So again, two orders of magnitude improvement in terms of power utilization. And then just for comparison, uh, here's the Raspberry Pi over here, which you can see is much faster, but like we talked about, I mean, it really just is a computer, so. Um. All right, so let's talk about MicroPython now in more detail. And so I thought I sort of thought of this in two ways, like how does MicroPython compare to CPython, and then what it, what's similar and what's different about that? So the similarity is that it's the same language that we're used to with Python, so we can program these microcontrollers to do things using the same stuff that we already know. It's the same language. Uh, MicroPython implements the Python 3.4 language specification, so there are some newish features in Python that are not available in MicroPython at present, but it's, uh, but it's pretty modern, I think you could say. Um, we have a REPL, so we can connect to it and interactively type things in, and we can try stuff out. We can try messing with our hardware, devices, sensors, whatever that we've attached to the 8266 or, or any other MicroPython compatible board. And in fact, on the 8266, since it has Wi-Fi, we can even connect to it, as opposed to a wire, like through the USB port, we can connect to it uh, through a web page and actually work with the device th through a web interface. Uh, and both 
Both platforms have PIP for installing packages. So if you were to look in PyPI, there's a number of packages that all start with MicroPython, Dash, whatever. Those are packages that are intended to be run on MicroPython. And you can install those on a MicroPython device using the UPIP uh, module. So same ideas of what PIP would do. It will go out and fetch your uh, dependencies and so forth. And then, of course, both are open source. So we can see how it's written. We can make changes to it and make it better. Uh, and the internal implementation for both, of course, is, uh, is written in C. So that's kind of the skill set you need if you actually want to do development. But you don't need to be a developer. You don't need to work with the C code to get benefit of MicroPython or try it out. So let's talk about what's different. So, so of course, the devices we're talking about are much smaller. They have much less uh, long-term storage, the flash memory. So we can't have all of the standard modules that are available in CPython. We potentially can come along and install additional modules that we need for our own specific project. But, uh, but that's what we need to do. Um, so as a result, we have fewer modules. And then there's modules that are provided by the system that are typically written in C. So they're sort of maximum performance. They've been optimized. Those modules. Um, usually start with the underscore U. So like if you want to work with sockets, you would import the U socket uh, module uh, as opposed to the socket module. Uh, but one thing to know is that when there are things that appear to be standard modules, sometimes there's functionality that's been stripped out. So they may not have every API uh, that are, you know. So for a simple example, uh, I was working on some code, and I wanted to use the partition function that was available for strings in CPython. And for example, that doesn't happen to be available uh, in MicroPython, but there's many other ways to do effectively the same thing. So that's just a choice where they said, hey, let's not put this extra thing because it just takes that much more space in memory and the, and the flash, and, and that's where we are. So also, though, we need, we can't just have a subset of the standard stuff. We need a way to work with the hardware to turn things on and off, and CPython doesn't have that as part of the standard library. So we have additional um, hardware-oriented modules. We can import modules like machine that, and then get access to things like pins. And we'll see a sample of that in a, some code samples in a second. Uh, there's also some language enhancements. Uh, the particular ones that come to mind are uh, in MicroPython, there are some decorators that you can use that actually cause it. Instead of, to, instead of emitting Python bytecode, they'll emit native code for the platform you're on. Um, and there's another one they have uh, called Viper, which is uh, which is even faster. I mean, it uses native code, but it restricts some of the f features of Python that you can actually use. So there's ways to optimize your code and get better performance on your device if that's a concern. Now, probably the most important thing under the hood, not important as a user, but important to make it work, is memory management. So regular Python primarily uses reference counting. Uh, MicroPython uses a garbage collection scheme. Uh, and probably more importantly than that is it has a different way of representing objects in memory. So regular Python doesn't have a goal to be so memory efficient, so it stores things like reference counts as big 64-bit numbers and various pointers to different structures. And so MicroPython's really tried to optimize that so that every object that needs to be stored in the heap is smaller first off. And then other things, when possible, get stored on the stack. Or even in the case of like integers, it has a way that if you have numbers that are effectively would fit within a 31-bit integer. It can, instead of storing a full object, it can literally just store that in a 32-bit number um, on the stack. And then lastly, and just an important, uh, not important to get started, but something to know, is MicroPython and regular CPython have different uh, licensing schemes. And so MicroPython is the MIT license, so you have a lot of flexibility with what you can do. But I do know that the core developers of MicroPython and the associated libraries are very careful about um, people taking code from CPython and bringing it over to MicroPython because the licenses aren't compatible. So as an end user, I mean, you can do what you want within the, you know, whatever those licenses allow you to do. But in terms of the core application, they don't want to let that, that leakage. So that does imply that micro, MicroPython, if it's not sort of apparent, is a, I'm not sure if clean room implementation is the right word, but, it's, but a new implementation from the ground up. It doesn't share any of the code with CPython. Okay. So we saw the first demo, so let's actually take a look at some code to see how that works. So I have just basically two, uh, two code blocks. So as we saw, the, the uh, costume was doing random colors every uh, three seconds. And the thing is to point out here, so you can see some of these U modules, uh, random and time might be modules that you know from uh, 
Python, but here we import them as U modules, indicating that they're implemented in the C code in MicroPython. And then here we're implementing some specific modules related to the hardware, right? So this machine module gives us access to the pins on the 8266. And then the NeoPixel module actually knows the protocol to communicate with these uh, lights and be able to set their colors. So you're going to start with some modules like that. And then the typical way that we write microcontroller code is there's some sort of initial setup. And if, if you've done Arduino, for example, you've definitely seen this before because there's like a setup and a loop function. But here we have some initial setup what we need to do. So as I mentioned, there's six strips of light. So I've had to identify by number which pin they're connected to. And then I actually create a, a pin object in MicroPython. And then lastly, I uh, create a NeoPixel object for each of those strips of light. So a NeoPixel uh, instance represents that strip of lights. And this number 40 just indicates the number of NeoPixels, so uh, it will only push color out to as, like if you only say 20, but you actually have 30 lights, and the last 10 would be blank, or you know, not have any color, this would be black, for example. So in my case, every strip doesn't have 40. You can use a bigger number, but this makes it simple. I didn't count all the lights on all the, all the strips. So then the next thing is we need some sort of operation that repeats forever, right? We just basically run the same code in a loop. So here I'm just getting random colors. Um, I did mention, and the comment here says this, is that the NeoPixels support 24-bit color, but the, br the brighter the color, the more power the devices use. And since uh, for various like low-level electrical technical reasons, I'm just using 7-bit, so a little bit. Uh, so I'm actually only running this at half brightness is the way to say it. At most, it runs at half brightness, but it, so it could, should be quite a bit brighter. So basically, I'm just creating, I need to create some sort of red, green, blue value, which is, the, which is gonna be the color, it has those three elements. I need to pick some random bits for that, seven bits, so a value in the range from zero to 127. And then we populate all the, I do this in two loops so that the color transition all is at the same time as opposed to like seeing different strips go in different orders. But basically push all that data to the strips or push it to the buffer for the strips. And then lastly, we actually write it out to the NeoPixels and then have some sort of delay before we do it again. So that's, that's the basic structure of um, how we do this. All right, so I have a different demo. We'll actually connect to the device and have it run some different code. Let's see. So first off, just need to hook that to a USB cable that goes to my computer. All right, so it's running the first demo again that's been pre-programmed in. All the code's loaded in, but I basically need to connect to it and have it run something different. So let's see. <coughs> if you'd like to. If it, yeah, just be careful with the cords because they're not too long. Thank you. All right, so here we are. This is the Python REPL prompt. And so first thing, I'm, it doesn't really nece necessary, but I'm just gonna reboot the device. If I hit Control D, it does the soft reboot. And now it's running the, the main script that's been loaded in, so I just hit Control C to stop the script like you would do in regular Python. Um, just to show you, we can, for example, import the UOS module. And on the flash memory, since MicroPython doesn't take four megabytes on this device, it uses the rest of the memory as a file system, so you can actually put files onto the device. So we can do things like, again, we don't have an operating system, we can't go to bash and like run commands that we might be familiar with, but we can use Python commands. So I can do like list dir and see what files are actually on the device. So to run this second demo, all I need to do is just import uh, the module. Hopefully everything will go smoothly. So let's do one thing first. So this, uh, this demo, what's gonna happen is, uh, I basically, same idea that the lights change color, but I've set it as an input to use the signal strength talking to my phone for the Wi-Fi wi communication. So let's turn off, I'll turn off the Wi-Fi hotspot on my phone for a minute. So if I import this, um, so red indicates that there's no signal, right? So if I turn the hotspot back on, So 
So in a moment it should change. So, so the hotspot signals are basically uh, like a number from negative 80 to negative 30. The negative 80 is the weakest signal, basically no signal, and negative 30 would be like a pretty strong signal. So like if it's really close to the device, it should turn purple, I think. That's like a second. You wanna, and I, George offered to, he'll take my phone out, uh, take a little distance, and you can see the colors change. It does take a minute to scan to uh, update the, the lights, because it has to scan for different Wi-Fi signals. But basically, as the, as the signal gets weaker, the color will uh, continue to evolve. Yeah, there's some messages from the lower level software that kind of sits underneath MicroPython, and then the one that indicates the signal strength, that's a message that's actually printed in the code that I've written. Yeah, that's, that's fine. So, so I would have brought my two-year-old along. That would have been a great demo. I'm sure he would have run around and the color would change, but I thought that might be kind of a little too disruptive for the rest of the demo anyways, the rest of the time. All right. If you want to put it down and rest your arm for a minute, you can. And then we'll do another demo in a minute. But we'll I'll stop that. We'll just leave that. All right. So I'll show you the, um, some highlights of the code for this demo. And then I have one more demo that we will do, which I won't show you the code for. But all the code is on uh, GitHub. I need to update the README file to provide, provide some more context. But if you'd like to look at the code, you, it's, uh, it is there. Okay, so I mean this is similar to what we saw a little bit ago where uh, we need to import of course a bunch of things being Python. The main thing here is since we're actually working with the Wi-Fi module on the 8266, we need to import this network module. And then the other thing is, so there's a trick, is the signal strength as you saw and I mentioned is a number from negative 80 to negative 30, but somehow I need to translate that into different colors where colors are defined by three separate numbers. So I need to map that one number into three numbers somehow. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is there happens to be an, an algorithm for, it's already in standard Python, C Python, that converts hue, saturation, and value to RGB. So I've actually just taken the color sys module that's available in standard Python, probably not one that you're likely to have used, but it, it is there. And then it does exactly this. So that's what I use to, uh, to translate the signal strength to a color. And then to actually work with the Wi-Fi, it's very straightforward. Now, in this case, I'm not actually connecting to the access point. I'm just scanning for access points. But the Wi-Fi that's built into the 8266 can be used as a client, or it can be used as an access point. So you can actually have it be the access point I could connect from my laptop, or it can actually do both at the same time. But it does only have one radio, so it can only be on one channel at the same time. So in this case, we basically just get an instance of this uh, WLAN class, and then we just say it's active. And then from that point, we can actually use an additional API to, to scan for the uh, scan for access points. So again, there's one a while true loop, just a loop that we're going to run forever. And uh, I've cut a little bit off of the. Actually, I think I guess maybe it might be on the next slide. Um, so basically, I just scan for the access points, and there may be a lot in this area. So I'm filter the, filtering them based on a constant that I've defined, a list of access points that I want to keep an eye on. So, for example, the name of my phone's access point. Um, use that information to basically just extract the signal strength that's in this tuple that's here. And if the, and this is obviously not happening for my phone, but if I was in a place where the access point, uh, there were multiple access points with the same name, I'd want to actually find what the strongest single signal strength is. So that's what's going on here. And if for some reason I can't find any access points, I just treat it as the minimum value that I've defined as a constant. And then use that, uh, the function I just talked about, well, I should say this. This is another function I'm not showing right here, but this is using that hue saturation value to RGB function in color assist to actually uh, to generate the color tuple. And so this is the bottom part of that loop, and it's exactly the same as what we saw with the other, other demo. Uh, and the, the very last thing here is, in this case, I'm doing it as fast as I can, as fast as I can scan the Wi-Fi access points. I'm updating the colors. And now one thing you do have to be careful of is if you're just doing computation, like there's a mechanism in the device that basically tries to keep an eye to see if the device is stalled or something bad has happened and it does a reset if it has. So like in this case, I need to have a sleep zero and that basically just gives control back to the very bottom layer of software so it knows that things are going okay. Otherwise, it'll basically surprisingly reset and it'll be disappointing. 
And then in embedded devices, that term is usually it's referred to as a watchdog timer. OK. So for the last demo, I'm very brave. We'll see if this works. Uh, it is interactive, so you'll be able to connect to the costume and actually send it commands. So if you'd like to do that, I'll show you the instructions in just a moment. But you can use either your uh, laptop, use a web, your web browser, or you can use your phone. Let's see. Let's start up the code first, and then, uh, yeah, and then I will show you. Okay, just making sure I'm not forgetting anything. All right. Um, so I'm going to go back over to the REPL, right? And I'm at the prompt. And let me remind myself of the the name I need to, the script I need to run, the module. So I'll list the files again. And I'm going to import the Internet of Things costumes module. And the way this is going to work is so in IoT devices or embedded devices, um, a popular protocol for communicating is something called MQTT. It's actually an old protocol, for, I think, from the 80s. Um, it's a message queuing, a lightweight message queuing protocol, message passing protocol. So basically what's going to happen is this is connecting to a server called a broker. And so I'm using a, there's a free service on the internet called HiveMQ, a company that sells various MQTT related services. I'm connecting to their server and subscribing to a particular channel where I can listen for messages. And so from your web browser, you'll be able to send messages and actually change the color of the device. So let's, let's see how this works out. So I will show this to you, but uh, I'm going to hold off so you can see the screen here. So basically, if you want to try this, you just, in your web browser, you need to go to this page, which is uh, a WebSocket-based client in your browser that communicates with the MQTT broker. Uh, I've had a little bit of problem that their service being free is not always up, so we'll see. Let me see if I have, oh, what am I doing? Sorry, I will, I will bring that back up. What do I want to do here? Um, let's just see. So this is basically what you should see. I can show you kind of in real time if you've gotten that URL. So it's, again, hivemq.com slash demos slash websocket dash client. And so you should get a page that looks like this. Depending on your screen size, it may be laid out a little bit different. There's a bunch of stuff here to initiate your connection, but you don't need to change any of this. You just need to click the connect button. And if all goes well, that red, it's currently a red dot, should turn green. So that's a good sign. Um, and then I'm going to, you don't have to do this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a topic subscription in my web browser, which means I'll actually be able to see the messages that come in from my browser. So the, the topic that we're going to use is just costume slash one. And again, you don't have to do this part, but this will let you see the messages if you want. So you just click subscribe. Um, and I've kind of zoomed in. This is, so after this, it'll start showing the messages at the bottom, although they won't quite fit. Um, and then in this area where it says publish, we can put in, uh, I can type costume slash one. And then in the message, I just need to put uh, C colon, and then I'm going to give it some sort of uh, RGB value. Um, so let's just say, uh, I'll just make it white, right? So if I put red, green, and blue to uh, the same value, it'll be a white color. So there, yeah, so there it changed. So feel free if you'd like to, uh, or in, Holler out if you're having some sort of problem. Maybe I can tell you, or if you need me to go back to the slide with the. So that is pretty much everything I have. We have about uh, 10 minutes of time scheduled left, so you're 
continue playing with, playing with this if you'd like, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if people have questions as well. For the costume? Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Fred was just asking what the cost of the costume was. So I had to buy the hoodie and the pants first off. Uh, that was probably $20 <laughs> at Kohl's. And then uh, these NeoPixels you can probably buy on eBay or get them cheaper, again, ordering them from China. I got them from Amazon to get them faster. You can buy like a five meter roll of those and they cost about $40. So there's like 300, 300 lights. This is about 150 lights that are in use, about half the roll. Um, then the 8266 is, you know, $5, 450 from China. And then, of course, just the wires and heat shrink and uh, solder that I use to, to put it all together. I think that's, that's everything. Um, have you yet been able to know what kind of life cycle you get out of one of those boards? How long does the board last? Well, they should last indefinitely, but, I mean, as a hobbyist, like, the first one that I bought I used for a few months, and then I somehow burnt out one of the pins, and that was fine because I didn't need all the <laughs> pins, but I, but I had something I was trying to do and it didn't work, and after debugging it, I finally figured out that the pin was not working anymore. Um, you know, if you've built a circuit and you've built it electrically correct, it should run indefinitely is my expectation. Is there a good community around this chip like there is with Arduino or uh, yeah, so the question is, what is, what's the community like around the 8266? And maybe I'll extend that to mention the MicroPython community as well. Um, so the 8266 community, I have not had a lot of interaction with. Just uh, within MicroPython, things pretty much work. Um, I will say that, so I, I did, let's see, at first I was trying to do something before I got involved with MicroPython with the 8266, and it was, so I was working with the C code, and I did find on GitHub at least that the, the maintainers of the project, like there's some code, that, so you can basically program these devices using the Arduino IDE, um, so it's kind of tied in with the Arduino community, there's something, use a thing in the Arduino IDE called a board manager to set it up. But anyway, um, so there's a, there's a plug-in to work with the 8266, and I found some bugs in a module I was using, or, well, not Python module, a library, and I submitted a fix, and they just basically accepted it. So that community might, I mean, it's not so much about the community, I guess, as at least the GitHub process around the Arduino, um, the Arduino plugin, and that, it seemed like the guy is so busy who main, maintains that, as long as your stuff logically makes sense, he seemed to just sort of accept it. He didn't, I don't, didn't get the impression that he, like, actually even read all the code or anything, but... Um, so that's kind of my extent of my involvement with the 8266 community is through that, that Arduino part. Um, I will say there's a whole MicroPython community. People are running MicroPython on a variety of different boards. And there's, a f there's forums for MicroPython. Uh, there seems to be a lot of activity. It's, um, you know, I think it's growing in, in interest. There's people doing commercial products with their projects. Um, so you definitely can get help. Uh, I, mean, I know definitely a concern with MicroPython is you know, because we have so limited memory on these devices that they don't want to just accept every random thing that people contribute to the code base. So it is a little bit more tricky in that if you submit an idea, they may or may not agree to that it makes sense. Um, but there's definitely, again, places to get, to get help with all of this. Um, I don't know if you could speak at all to the, uh, like the durability of those chips. Like, would it be, be good for like, a project that's going to be outside or something? Um, the yes, thank you for my... Uh, so the question is, what would the durability be of this stuff if you're going to do some sort of like device outside, right? So the, the module itself, that circuit board I showed you, like any sort of electrical device, I mean, you wouldn't want to get that wet, but you certainly could find some sort of enclosure that you could put it outside in, in a different sort of environment. Um, you just would need to protect it so the elect electronics don't actually get wet. And you didn't ask, but I was mentioning the NeoPixels. I mean, I've been playing with this costume and this idea for a, l a little bit now. And I've heard stories of people having problems where like one of the lights failed and it affected the rest of the, the chain. But I mean, these are on these flexible circuit boards basically. And I've yet to see any problems since I've put this together. So I was a little nervous that that could be a problem. So these actually seem quite, um, uh, quite good as far as durability. And the worst case is if one burnt out or something, you could, you could replace it. So I should mention, when you buy a roll of these NeoPixels, there's contacts between each light, so you can literally cut them and you can make the strips any length that you want. The LED droppers are directly on the strips? Uh, so the 826, the, I'm sorry, the, the NeoPixels, 
Technically, they use a semiconductor. I think it's referred to as a WS2812. And so the little LED module has a, like a, I don't know if this is technically the right term, because I'm not an electrical engineer, but like a microcontroller inside. So you send signals to, to, to tell it the color, and then the, the integrated circuit that's inside the LED actually uses like pulse width modulation to affect the colors. So it's all self-contained. You just have to adhere to their signaling protocol that is, by the way, very timing specific. So I've heard it's challenging to make, it's possible, but challenging, for example, to make these work with the Raspberry Pi because you have to have very precise timings to shift out all the bits that need to go. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. I just had, didn't write any code that does that. So, what was the oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. I keep forgetting that. Uh, excellent. So, yeah, so the question was, are the lights actually individually addressable? And the answer is yes. Each light is self-contained. And basically, um, I just use these fill functions that populate the whole strip with one color. But like for MicroPython, I could set a color f you know, for the zeroth light, the first light, the second light, the, et cetera, like in an array, and I could push it out and, and yeah, the lights are individually addressable. So they, we could do rainbow effects and stuff. I just don't have a sample that does that right now. One thing, a minor thing, but in MicroPython, I found the built-in NeoPixel driver um, is partially written in C and partially in Python. And it's not as fast as it needs to be to get the best results. If you do want to have animation, the problem I ran into was um, it just was jerky, basically, because the time it took not to write out the colors to the lights, but to update the buffer and memory is slow. But I've played with it. There's workarounds, but probably you have to write some C code or something to do that. Any, anything else? Yep. Well, one, I'd be really disappointed to hear that you don't have one of these in your size. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one in my size. <laughs> So the question was, yeah. So the question was, could you make some sort of dog collar that used like radio signals, Wi-Fi, to create like a perimeter with the you know, your pet, your dog left that perimeter that it would, uh, you know, light up or um, make sound or both. Uh, and yeah, I don't see a reason why that couldn't be done. I mean, the only problem with that is with the Wi-Fi at least is that like doesn't have a super fixed perimeter. I think there's other, and there might be better ways to do that, like with Bluetooth or something, because I know there's like these, uh, what's the, the Bluetooth? Yeah, like, yeah, beacons, that's the word I was thinking of. So there might be better ways to, but the general idea, yeah, that, I don't know if that's been done, but it could be. I just want 5%. <laughs> <laughs> Any, yep. Yeah, that's a good, a good question. So how big a, how big a battery is necessary? Uh, so my child didn't, it was a long story, you can come ask me about it later, but I didn't actually wear it that long, but I did plan on this, and so I tried to figure it out. So I had bought a, or was, had a 20,000 milliamp hour battery from Amazon, just like a you know, USB one that you could buy. And so I measured that with the, I think it was the full strip of lights, the five meters of lights, uh, and it ran for, oh, at half brightness, it ran for four hours. So, I mean, you do need a battery that has enough power. And another consideration, if you're gonna use a lot of these, this is like the thing I was most nervous about, is these draw a fair amount of power if they're at, f at full brightness and like, like the white, because each color draws some power. So if you're only doing blue, you don't have the power consumption of green or red as an example. But if you're doing white and everything is on, that's like potentially 60 milliamps. And so if you multiply that over all the lights, you actually get quite a few amps. And that's a problem because like the batteries, um, you know, are not designed to create 10 amps, for example, right? So that's actually why on this, there's actually two USB plugs, as I had intended that it actually could go to two battery packs so that the current draw would be split across those two battery packs. So um, I'm sure you can do more sophisticated things, but that's sort of my uh, electronic skill level, I guess. So, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So is the AC66 uh, only Wi-Fi? Does it have Bluetooth or any other wireless protocols? Uh, it does not have Bluetooth, but the... Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, the A266 only has Wi-Fi, but the ESP32 has both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Yep. Do you have any other projects planned? Uh, no, I'm not working on anything uh, particularly interesting. This is probably the most 
sophisticated thing I made. I mean, I will mention, well, actually, one thing I'm working on, but it's mostly a software project, is um, what I'd like to do is be able to have them use MQTT, but actually communicate with Am the Amazon Web Service IoT, I AWS IoT service, which uses MQTT, but they have a lot of security considerations around using that, which is great, but it requires more software to do all the signatures and stuff, and um, that's challenging. So I've actually been working on trying to get that I, actually, I mean, I have a prototype that works, but uh, trying to get those changes incorporated back into the MicroPython code base so other people could um, do that as well. So I will mention one, one last thing, and maybe we're out of time, yeah, um, is, um, so if any of you are in the Austin area and you're interested in this sort of thing, we do have a group uh, that meets up, well, it was at the tech shop. I don't know of the tech shop. They just unfortunately declared bankruptcy this week, so I don't know where we're going to meet. But uh, basically, we meet every other Tuesday at like 7 o'clock. It's the North Austin Gadget Hackers Group, and so people bring devices like this and do different projects. And so uh, feel free to ask me more about that or come, come join us if you'd like. So I think that's the end of the time. If you're interested in this, come chat with me. I'd be happy to talk more about it. Or Yeah, so thank you.